On this episode of the Deerskin Diary, we're going to be talking about 18th century frontier turkey hunting. So stay with us. All right, so there were no hunting laws in the 18th century on the frontier, so it's really difficult to kind of go back and experience a turkey hunt like a lot of frontier folk in the 18th century would have experienced. For example, Daniel Tribune in 1779 said that his method of turkey hunting one day was to wait until the turkeys went to roost and there were five of them in this particular tree. And he uh, waited until you know th they went to roost, which would be somewhere right around dusk or so. And then he moved himself into a position where the turkey were between him and the, uh, the exposed skyline there, the moonlight. And then he proceeded to shoot all five of the fattest turkeys uh, he's ever had. And I think that's uh, something that's frowned upon in every state in the Union today. So uh, please don't try that like Daniel Tribute did. And James Adair said that they likewise make turkey feather blankets with the long feathers of the neck and breast of the large fowl. They twist the inner ends of the feathers very fast into a strong double thread of hemp or the inner bark of the mulberry tree of the size and strength of a coarse twine as the fibers are sufficiently fine and they work it in the manner of fine netting. As the feathers are long and glittering, this sort of blanket's not only very warm, but pleasing to the eye. You know, there's really only two kinds of documented calls that I can find uh, in, in the 18th century. And, and one is uh, pretty easy to make here. This is a wing bone turkey call. This is one that I made from a turkey that I killed, my very first turkey that I ever killed. And this is just two of the wing bones themselves. Very easy to make. I mean, you could honestly make this from a turkey wing you buy at Walmart. Um, you just boil the, the, the turkey bones themselves until all the meat falls out and you use a piece of wire or something to sort of clean out the ends and make them hollow. And then you figure out there's usually three bones associated with the wing and you kind of figure out how they fit together. In this case, these two fit together best. And I just used a little pine pitch, a little pine sap uh, to glue the two pieces together and then I wrapped it with some uh, with some brain tan buckskin and I just put a little lanyard on it so it stays around my neck. And the way you use these calls, by the way, the oldest, uh, this is the oldest documented turkey call. Uh, there, there's, there's one uh, that's documented in a museum in South Carolina, the National Wild Turkey Federation Museum. It's documented to 4,000 years old. So we know these were around uh, in, especially, certainly in the 18th century, and they were around before uh, European contact. Very easy call to use. Um, just kind of put the narrow end here to your lips and you make like a little kissing sound, if you will, on, on the narrow end. And I hold the trumpet end here um, with my hand over it and I can adjust kind of the loudness for, for the wing bone call itself. Um, this is probably the loudest turkey call that you can get. So sounds a little something like this if, if I do it right. You see, I'm still practicing a little bit myself, but uh, works pretty good and it certainly gets the sound out there so those, those gobblers can hear it and they can um, let you know they're around if they choose to answer you. So when we talk about Native American communication, we can turn back to our, our old friend James Adair, who lived with most of the southeastern tribes in the 18th century. He was an Irish trader. And one of the things that he talked about was the, the use of animal calls for communication. He said that they separate themselves as far as each can hear the other's traveling signal, which is the mimicking such birds and beasts as frequent the spot and they can exactly imitate the voice and sound of every quadruped and wild fowl, fowl through the American woods. Now, I'm certainly no expert at turkey calling, but I am gonna give it a shot here and show you um, how I have, have, have learned to do it. Um, and it seems to work okay so far. Um, what I typically do is, um, and I, I didn't make this up, I'm following some other folks that I learned from, 
um, especially here on YouTube. And uh, one of the ways that I do it is I inhale air and that gives me that sort of raspy, uh, raspy hen voice, if you will. Um, and I kind of move my, my mouth and lips as I inhale and uh, try to get that hen sound. So it goes a little something like this. <clears throat> Not too bad. So there you go, folks. This one was, again, short and sweet. Just wanted to talk a little bit about um, some, some period documented calls like the wing bone call and the voice call and the use of, of mimicry uh, along the frontiers is not only communication with animals in a hunting scenario, but also communication with each other in a potential uh, scouting, spying, or warfare scenario. Um, the use of turkey feathers as, as clothing, right? That's, that's one that's not very um, well I should say known or discussed, and I think it's absolutely fascinating. I'd love to try to make one one day. Don't know if I'll be able to. Don't know if I have the talent. A um, couple of things I, uh, I did want to mention, though, since it is either already your turkey season or uh, almost uh, mine in this case, I want to talk about safety just a second. Um, you know, it is a lot of fun to hunt in this 18th century manner, um, but, but of course, um, with, with turkey hunting especially, there are a couple of things that I avoid. And it's not just a modern thing, right? It's a, it's a historical thing. And I have an account for you in just a second that, that discusses it. But what I mean by that is I try to avoid things like, uh, like blues and reds. I know blues and reds are very common colors on the frontier, you know, with leggings and, and, and handkerchiefs and things. Um, this happens to be a blue handkerchief here. This hap these happen to be uh, red and blue leg garters for leggings. I absolutely avoid those during turkey season for what I think are obvious reasons. And, and that has to do with um, the potential for another hunter mistaking you in the twilight hours or whatever for, uh, for, for being a turkey. So I try to wear colors that are lighter, um, that you really couldn't uh, reasonably mistake for a turkey. Uh, and I find that there's really not that much of a need for camouflage, that this blends in so well as long as I stay still that uh, I, I've not found a need for the, the massive amounts of camouflage that you see folks running around with. It certainly helps, right? I won't lie about that. But um, for, for me, it's the, the thrill of the chase. For me, it's the, the ability to do this um, without all the fancy gear. That safety concern is not just a, a 21st century thing. Uh, hunter safety was a thing in the 18th century as well. I have an article here from the Pennsylvania Gazette in 1760, and it says that one Josiah Bassett, hearing some turkeys, intended to have the first chance and went also after them, unknown to and unknowing of the rest of his party, and getting first to the place where the turkeys were, was creeping in the bushes on his hands and knees in order to get up to them. Meanwhile, the rest of his party surrounded the place, and one Jesse Baker, having started one of the turkey, it flew and alighted near the place where Josiah Bassett was, who had on a dark gray bearskin coat. Now, bearskin was a rough, coarse type of wool, it was fuzzy outside. It was a thickly woven wool that was used to turn uh, like the rain and the wind, used oftentimes as an outer layer, or outer garment. And he'd taken off his hat and cap, and his hair being short and black, Baker saw the glimpse of him through the bushes, and his hair and parts of his coat resembling the color, and having as then seen the appearance of a turkey, Baker hesitated whether he should shoot or not. When Bassett made a noise, imitating the cry of a turkey, which he did very exactly. And when Baker fired at a distance of six rods, he shot a ball through his vitals and sundry other shot into his body. He gave one scream and the company run up, but found him dead, one hand only having a little motion. So folks, there you go, a hunting tragedy in the 18th century on the frontier. So uh, be cognizant of what you're wearing and how you might look and sound to other hunters that may not know you're there. And uh, let's be safe and have a good turkey season this year. So there you go, folks, a simple one this week on turkey calls and different uses of turkey in the 18th century and frontier turkey hunting techniques. Uh, I hope you have a great safe season. I hope you get out and try some of these things. Hey, even if you don't turkey hunt, maybe make a turkey wing bone call. 
like I said before, you can, you can use the wing bones you buy at the store. It doesn't have to be a wild turkey, certainly. And it just gets you that much closer to a, a little historical experience. Um, if you like the video, please smash that like and subscribe button. It helps us know what you care about and what you don't care about. It helps us motivated to keep making more videos. So I appreciate you spending time with me again this week, and thank you for sharing history with us.